Hi everybody and welcome back to Teology. Today we are drinking a mulled wine tea called Mulled Wine Magic from T2 and it has in it apple pieces, hibiscus, rose hip, cinnamon, ginger, cloves, star anise, natural flavouring and orange wedges. It's quite, it smells like you open it and it smells like when you're making mulled wine and it's a really doo -doo -doo, pretty tea and we are talking about Christmas again and past few weeks we've been talking about Christmas stories and we are continuing with that today. Christmas has been celebrated for about 1800 years at first appearing as a celebration a couple centuries after Jesus. This is from the historical records that we can find. This is a long time and is a long time for different stories and beliefs to become attached to it, just like different stories and beliefs get attached to a lot of the Bible. And there are many, many misconceptions, false facts, and like assumed facts that aren't really facts that people share about Christmas. Some of these are beliefs about its origins with like it taking over different pagan festivals and winter solstices and that type of thing. Um, some are to do with how it spread and who spread it and malicious intent often I find. Um, and some are about the origins of Santa and St Nicholas. There are so many different misconceptions around and about Christmas. So we really need to focus. So today we will be focusing on the Christmas story really specifically because that's what we've been looking at and we're going to look at the Christmas story and in my opinion there are two different Christmas stories that we share. There is the cultural Christmas story and the biblical one. Now when I say cultural I'm not talking about like secular Santa and reindeers and flying around the world at the North Pole delivering presents. Think more Christmas nativities and Christmas plays and Christmas shows and some of the Christmas carols and that type of thing. Not all of them are inaccurate but a fair few of them have little inaccuracies in them and that is the cultural Christmas story. These cultural Christmas stories are in the nativity scenes they display Mary and Joseph and like stable at the back of an inn with angels and the wise men and the shepherds and the star and all of that and the in the plays it always starts with Mary riding a donkey and Joseph walking along beside her on the way to Bethlehem and they get there and they go round knocking on all the different innkeepers doors and there's no room no room no room and eventually they have to go in the stable at the back where she has Jesus that night and then the shepherds show up and the wise men all together and they've got like the three different stories all interweaving and there's angels singing and stars and in some there's even a Christmas lobster. That in summary is the cultural Christmas story. So why am I calling it that? Isn't that just a Christmas story? Isn't that what happened? No, it's not. The most important part that Jesus was born is correct, but much of it is wrong and riddled with half-truths and quarter-truths and uh, different cultural conceptions and putting on of things, especially in our Western context. And there are a couple, uh, which are ones that we will begin with, that don't really feature in the story at all. Our first one is Mary and the donkey. We nearly always depict Mary riding on a donkey on the way to Bethlehem. And we did, she just didn't. Well, she didn't just not. She might have, but she probably didn't. As riding on a donkey when you're quite pregnant, I can assume would be really uncomfortable. Um, I did ask some people I know who have been pregnant, like my mum and my fiance's mum, and 
both of them said, yeah, I don't think that would be particularly enjoyable. In reality, we don't know how we, how they got there. Um, the only reference that's made to them traveling is in Luke 2, 1 to 5, um, where it says they have to travel for a census. And then um, uh, in verse four, it says, so Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judah, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. And that's all we know. That is really, really important information for the Christmas story and for Jesus being a descendant of David and uh, fulfillment of prophecy with it coming from the root of David. But that's not riding on a donkey. That just tells us they went from this place to this place for this reason. No idea on how they got there. It doesn't tell us how they traveled, only where and only why. What is argued to be like the most likely way she traveled is wagon, but that's still speculation. So it's not, I wouldn't say it's wrong to depict Mary riding a donkey, but I do think that we can be a bit nicer to her in our Christmas plays than forcing them to ride donkeys. You know, like, we, we, could, we could come up with something else. They could just walk, they could ride a wagon, all sorts. So also donkeys were quite expensive back then, often used as pack animals or that type of thing. So it's unlikely from that cultural perspective that she would have ridden a donkey. So it's not wrong, it's just not right. You know, it's one of the areas where we kind of need to go, we just don't know. Now, it's not great for a play, but you could do a really, like, fun scene in a play where she just gets there by, like, a whole bunch of different means, like, completely culturally wrong, and we know that they're wrong. Um, that could be really fun and help grapple with the idea of we don't actually know. The second misconception is, I think, probably one of the most persistent ones, like, uh... Yeah, it's quite an invasive one and a lot of people are really surprised when I told them, tell them um, the whole part of it. And that's about the inn and the innkeepers. There is no innkeeper that's not mentioned at all at the story. A lot of people assume there's an innkeeper because if there's an inn, there's an innkeeper. But there isn't an innkeeper. Um, and in short, there isn't really an inn. Well, at least not an inn in the way we imagine. The inn, as we imagine, typically uh, wouldn't have existed then. It was comes from a completely different culture. We typically imagine like British countryside, maybe 1600s England with the inn and the fire and the chairs and all of that stuff and where the travellers stay when they're passing through. However, this is not what an inn would have been, um, and it's not really how they would have been used then. As it was, and also it would have been culturally incorrect as it was custom then and is still in many parts of the Middle East to offer guests, especially family guests, a place to stay in the house. However, the use of the word in, in translations, is really debated in translations. The Greek word used, I might butcher this, so I'm going to put it on the screen, is kataluma. Now, this is defined as a place to loosen down, um, like loosen sandals and stuff, uh, is a lodging place, a guest room, an inn, a guest chamber, camping area, or oasis. These are different ways it could be used. Now, in many Bible translations, the word that they use is in. And so this isn't linguistically technically wrong to say in, but it doesn't mean public in, as that is a different Greek word and was not commonly used. One of the only times in the New Testament that that word is used is in the Good Samaritan story, which is uh, really interesting when you start looking at it even more so we'll probably unpack that a different time and I fell down quite the rabbit hole of researching the Good Samaritan story so culturally it doesn't make sense as I was saying before 
Mary and Joseph are returning to Joseph's family town. This is where he is from, so he will have family here that they could stay with. But everybody is returning to the family town to be registered. And so there wouldn't have been a lot of space. There are probably lots of relatives. And this is where the idea of no room comes from. Because it does say that in uh, 2 uh, verse 7, And she gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him in clothes and placed him in a major because there was no kataluma. So some in some lodging place, some guest room available for them. So the idea of no room is correct, but it's more like if you have everybody come to stay at your house, you're like, sorry, the spare bedroom's taken. There's space on the couch um, or space in this place or that place. You can stay there. And a manger is correct that's filled with hay um, an animal's feeding trough, basically. There, so there would have been a shortage of beds. They were probably staying in what's called the storage room, uh, which is attached to the house. But I think it typically contained like the animal's feed and uh, depending on what you read is where the animals slept at night. Uh, some sources say that the animals were often taken into the house to help keep the house warm at night because it would get really cold. Um, but Jesus was born in a manger, not necessarily a stable. Stables, again, are quite a new idea or weren't as culturally persistent in the time for someone to have a stable attached to their house necessarily. It's a little bit different and blurry there. Uh, but he was born in a manger. That is true. So the third misconception. The tea's got a really nice sweet and sour thing going so if you like sweet and sour teas, you might like this one, but it's one of their Christmas specials, so you'd only be able to get it then. So, the third misconception. When we look at the nativity scene and in plays and sets, it often comes with angels, which is a little bit wrong, just a little bit. All in all, there were probably angels around when Jesus was born, uh, you know, it's a huge event. God probably did see, you know, the angels probably were all like, oh, what's going on? Jesus is being born. This is so exciting. I've been waiting for this for so long. Um, so they probably were around, but it's not in the Bible that they were around. Um, they aren't mentioned as being visible to Mary and Joseph, even more so. There are angels talked about in the story. So what's being done is the uh, story of the shepherds is being taken and like part of the story of the shepherd story is being taken and applied somewhere else, which isn't quite, it's a bit of questionable practice really, uh, because it twists the story. Um, often these angels in nativity plays are singing glory to God or glory glory to God in the highest heaven on on earth peace to those on whom his favorite rests or you know glory glory to God hallelujah chorus that type of thing the verse I did just read is from Luke 2 14 which is in the story of the shepherds this is the shepherds are in the field and that's where an angel appears to them and they have the heavenly hosts of angels appear to them singing this chorus so they are found in the christmas story they are found uh praising god and saying or singing this phrase however they aren't explicitly found in bethlehem at jesus's birthplace um and I think it's important not to say they weren't there because they might have been, but to keep the stories in their context because that helps actually us keep the biblical mindset a bit better. I think it's a really good example of where we need to go. We just don't know 
but it's also a very good example of us taking parts of uh, Bible stories, stories and putting them in other areas. And this is something I have experienced a lot culturally. When I talk to my friends who aren't Christians but know things about the Bible, they'll take different stories and put them all together. So I've had people taking Noah's and Abraham's stories and putting them together, for example. And we need to be really careful as Christians that we don't do this to our kids or to ourselves of taking these ideas and merging them together, which helps, which co goes on to confuse and muddle an already complicated book. And it adds an unnecessary cloudiness, I think. It turns the Bible into a bunch of half-truths which takes away from the overall meaning and impact of the Bible when you go through it. And I think the next two misconceptions fall into the same category of ones in the Bible. Um, and it's in the Christmas story, it's just not the way that we imagine it or that we understand it to be. Um, and one of the most common ways that I find Christmas plays to be told is through this like switching of perspectives in the story between Mary and Joseph, the shepherds and the three wise kings and they're all going through ways to get there and it comes to a great climax when they all arrive and meet baby Jesus. However, this isn't quite rice. The shepherds, quite right, not rice. The shepherds would have been there not long after Jesus was born while he was, you know, still a baby. However, the wise kings, or more correctly, wise men, um, would not. We talked a fair bit about the wise men last, and I touched on some of these ideas briefly that we're gonna talk about, but they are probably the group, I would say, that have the most falsehoods and misunderstandings about their story connected with them. To begin with, we have no idea how many wise men there were we know that they brought three gifts um, and a plural is used so it's more than one but it could be two, three, four, seven, fourteen. We have no idea, we aren't actually given a number on how many were coming. We also don't know what they are, they're just referred to as wise men but they aren't kings. The only word that is used to denote them as something that isn't men in some translations, they talk about magi. Um, but however, none of them say kings. One of the leading theories is that they were some sort of astronomer um, so that they would like observe the stars so they would be able to notice when a star changed and was different. And they would have to notice that star to notice it was different. Really, this is just an example of us not really knowing, but putting in our own ideas so we can visualize it better and build a better story. However, the most incorrect thing about the wise men is that they were there on the night of Jesus's birth. We know that they were not. They arrived afterwards. It says in the Bible that they arrived afterwards. They probably arrived between Jesus being one and two. And we know this because of Herod's order in the story of the wise men that it talks about in the book of Matthew. And this does lead us quite nicely to our last misconception because it's also taking a part of the story from the wise men and putting it somewhere else. Um, and that's the star. Often in Christmas nativity and plays, there is a star showing above the place where Jesus is born and it's meant to be like a special star. And the star is culturally, in the cultural Christmas story, the one the wise men used to get there. However, the wise men didn't arrive till Jesus was a whole lot older and there wouldn't have been a star for them to follow because of the way stars work and move across the sky the star couldn't have been where Jesus was born at the time because then the wise men couldn't have been following the star because they would need to follow it across the sky to like move where they needed to move there definitely were stars the night Jesus was born um that might have been cloudy so they might not have been able to see the stars but they were definitely there and if it wasn't cloudy if it was a clear night 
we don't know the weather um, of the night Jesus was born. It could have been raining. It could have been a thunderstorm. Who knows? There were definitely stars, just not that specific star. And there were probably even more stars than we see in our night sky, even when we go out in the countryside because there was no light pollution at all. So we, and the wise men is the example, really good example in the star as well of us trying to make the Christmas story seem like this huge, great, rushing, climactic event that uh, all happened on one night. Uh, in reality, it happens over years. And we miss out on some really cool people in the story when we look at it this way, like Simeon and Anna, um, who we'll definitely talk about another time. And you know, you miss out on really good things in the story and on why Jesus fled to Egypt and when he fled, when his family fled to Egypt and how they did. And like, it doesn't make sense when you start doing uh, history on this passage when it all happens on the same night. And so this isn't a conclusive list of the differences between the biblical Christmas story and the cultural one, but I do think these are some of the main ones and help unpack some of the uh, really obvious problems between the differences in our cultural Christmas story and the actual Christmas story. Yeah, there are a lot more. And I would love to hear your thoughts on any that you find particularly interesting or if you have any different thoughts about them um, or further thoughts, please leave a comment or something down below. I would love to hear it. Thank you all for watching.